I noticed that uh, in your presentation, the assets uh, where Vanguard really took off and spiked and just left Fidelity in the trail happened about 2007. And uh, another thing happened in 2007, and I wonder what the correlation is. Uh, that was the founding of the uh, local heads or got. <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, without further ado, uh, a number of years ago, Jack asked uh, if uh, he could have a chat with Bill Bernstein and his wall, non political um, <laughs> chat. And we all know that what Jack wants, Jack gets. And it's become known as the Farsad chat. <laughs> So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jack's companion for the Farside Chat. He's a retired neurologist who helped co-found Efficient Frontier Advisors. He's written a number of best-selling titles in both finance and economic history. He holds both a PhD in chemistry and an MD. Please welcome one of the smartest guys I know, Dr. Bill Bernstein. Well, since you made sure that you made this kind of political, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Keynes versus Hayek. Um, you know, for, for those of you who aren't quite familiar with the debate, Keynes said that you could have Jack less. Yeah. You could, you could, oh, am I okay now? Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry, I'm still with you, Mr. Mara. So, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Keynes basically says that, you know, the rest of central bank. Uh, is necessary to uh, uh, bring, bring out the punch bowl uh, from unnecessary taking away when necessary. And I uh, said that uh, if, you know you only encourage booms and busts and get hard on inflation. And uh, of course, this became relevant in 2009 when the, uh, uh, the Fed brought out not just the punch bowl but the whole liquor store. <laughs> uh, and, and you know we haven't seen inflation. Uh, but there's still the risk of booms versus busts. I see things getting third and strong uh, from all the equipment. I'm wondering, Jack, how much you worry about that. Well, uh, let me say, begin with that perspective, and it reminds me of a comment from uh, Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader. Uh, Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader, I guess it's better, who was asked about the implications of the French Revolution. And uh, Mao said, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> and I think that's pretty wise. <laughs> and, and I, I, I'd say any case has been importantly vindicated by this last go around. Uh, I'm not sure what should have happened to our financial system, what would have happened to it had the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to a small to some extent, and the Congress to some extent. Back in those days, when Congress did things. Um, oh, <laughs> and uh, and you know, they pumped and pumped and pumped and are still where they stopped pumping, but they're not, they're not taking out any out of the well. And I think that helps to explain why we have all the industrialized in countries in the world have had the best recovery. Uh, Switzerland maybe ahead, but if you look at you know, France, Italy, uh, all the Greece out, uh, the United Kingdom and so on. No question, our recovery has been stronger, and I give the Fed a lot of credit for that. Particularly since this time, the Fed is operating with, with regard to the, the economy is operating with uh, one hand tied behind the regulator's back, and that is the conventional uh, economic wisdom. Because you needed only not only monetary policy, such as the Fed does, pump, pump, priming the pump. The bill says you also need fiscal policy. You need to run government deficits and spend more. And we have not done very well on the fiscal policy side at all. And uh, so the Fed has done it pretty much by itself. So how this will all be unbundled, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, whether it will be unbundled and have those huge uh, assets on the Fed on the Fed balance sheet, uh, everybody expects them to unwind. But maybe they'll just leave it the same for a while. And I think probably the most informed guess is, is uh, go, go in the direction of thinking these low interest rates are going to last for quite a while. And if that's what all the smart money is saying, I can 
consistent with my approach personality. Let's say if smart money is all betting no rise in rates, I bet on a rise in rates. <laughs> but I, I, I think that the smart money so far, whatever exactly that is, is about right. So I, I think uh, Keynes got this one pretty much right in an imperfect world. Yeah, but I relied much more on Keynes when I studied him back in college for his help on understanding the markets. And that's essentially where this, uh, he called it enterprise versus speculation, the long term yield of an asset versus the price that investors are willing to pay for it. And that's the fundamental of my investment theory, and I think increasingly everybody's investment theory. Yeah, I think the most fascinating bit of data uh, relevant to that uh, is that if you subtract out the long term tips yield from the long term treasury yield, you get an imputed uh, inflation rate over the next. 30 years of 1.6%. Um, you know, if you want to make an, an economic historian laugh, you can tell him that figure, if you remember that figure. Um, all right, well, Jack, you sort of buried your soul after the second martini to the last I only had one. I only had one. <laughs> but it was the last one, all right. And, and, and you told me that you own the International Bond Fund. <laughs> 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 I guess it was, maybe it was the martini. <laughs> no, did you say I owned? Well, you, you, yes, you, it, was in your, it was in your retirement plan. That was, no, no, I'm sorry, that, that is a misunderstanding. Oh. What did I say? <laughs> no, actually, the way the conversation went, uh, I decided to move, to get a little more conservative in my retirement plan, and I wanted to move, I'm presently in total bond market index and intermediate term my personal accounts. And when you try and do it in your retirement account at Vanguard, they have a limited list of funds and it includes total bond market fund, which for reasons I've said over and over again, I don't think is the optimal choice. It's 70% governments. And I wanted to go to an intermediate term bond index fund, which is about 35 or 40% or 45 or 50% governments. And I would like it to be even lower than that. But that intermediate term fund and the intermediate term managed fund which is run just like an index fund, are not eligible choices uh, for our retirement plan. We have a very limited number of choices. And one is the total US bond market and the total international bond market. And so what I was complaining to Bill was, why are they offering that as a choice when they could offer something that would make a lot more sense for 90% of all investors? So it's a small misunderstanding, but that, that's what's the fact. I wouldn't, when I do that, well, you got to be kidding. <laughs> Here's your opportunity to, to tell me why I'm still wrong about international value. Well, <laughs> first, uh, let, let's talk about you want international value or international and value? Inter international versus and value, yeah. Well, international, my, my thesis is so clear in my mind, uh, and uh, sorry, my thesis is so clear in my mind, I can even hear that echo, so I know I'm doing okay now. <laughs> and that is, first of all, if you invest in the S&P 500, uh, you will own an international portfolio. 50% of the revenues, almost 50%, 50% of the earnings of U.S. corporations come from outside the U.S. So this is not exactly Fortress America, the Monroe Doctrine America, and you have an international portfolio already. And why do you need even more than that? And I don't think you do. The argument used to be the international fluctuated differently and therefore gave you a higher risk adjusted return or something like that. And I don't think those interim fluctuations are worth a damn. If they don't matter, if you're investing for 50 years, what do you care about that short term correlation? And how many people even know what it is? But now that situation has changed anyway. And the correlation between international and uh, and domestic US, so-called international both non-US stocks and US stocks, it ran for many years, a long time ago, 15 years ago, ran about 35 or 40%, and now it's about 85%. And these last couple of years, it may be 95%. In other words, you don't get that thing that, is, that people say has value, that I don't believe has value, but whatever it is, it's gone. Is that too Pennsylvania Dutch an expression for all of you? Uh, so, look, the way I look at it is, and this is the way I've kind of run all my investment thinking, get behind the data. So, in concept, and non-U.S. investing, uh, you, know, you can 
say, well, it's a good idea for diversifying or something like that. Gives you more companies, whatever you want to say. But I look behind the international index to see what's in it. And the largest holding is UK. The second largest holding is Japan. The third largest holding is France. So the UK, well, they're not doing so hot. And poor labor has vanished, or almost vanished from the scene over there. And they still had more austerity than I think they should have. Their economy is not rebounded like ours. And I think they're an economy that is in a lot of ways, you know, built on tourism as kind of a yesterday thing. Used to be a huge coal mining country, that's, all, that's pretty much gone. So, not so much to be said about Britain. Japan, very structured society, very aging society. Every once in a while, a tsunami. What's so hot about that? <laughs> uh, not, that's not a good combination, particularly with a tsunami. And then I go to France. Oh, France. <laughs> you know, they don't work there anymore. <laughs> They were supposed to go with 35 hours a week and they went on strike. <laughs> 35 hours a week? I mean, who works? Does anybody in the room work only 35 hours a week? I mean, I don't. <laughs> and I'm hoping you guys. Um, and then I, I go to, to another step and I say, okay, I earn my money in dollars. I spend my money in dollars. I save my money in dollars. And I invest my money in dollars. I am tied to the dollar, my own currency. Uh, in the most productive economy in the world, the most entrepreneurial economy in the world, uh, the most innovative economy in the world, the most technologically advanced economy in the world. And so I want to go away from that. And, and how is that going to how is that going to improve my returns? Now, and I also add this sort of closing thought. So I just don't see the merit of any of why take a currency risk when you don't have to. Yes, it can be hedged, but it costs a lot of money. And when you get into international bonds, I'll sneak back on that one, Bill. The international bond yield is about 1.3%. And the U.S. bond yield is, depending on how you want to calculate it, 2.5% or 3%. Uh, and the, today's yield is what determines your future return on a bond. So it doesn't seem to me like a good bet. So it's, uh, I don't want to worry about foreign currencies. I also know that with the exception, maybe, of Switzerland and Great Britain, the institutions, financial institutions in the United States are the most established in the world. The protection of shareholder rights is the most established in the world. There isn't any possibility of currency controls getting, getting in the way of my getting liquidity from my non-U.S. investment. So, and my final icing on the cake is, when Warren decided to leave his 90% of his wife's estate that he's leaving to her in the S&P 500 index fund, um, he obviously wasn't thinking about international. I did have the temerity to write to him when I saw that in his annual report a couple of years ago. As the money, I think we took in an extra $9 billion in an index business was like this, and then Warren speaks and it goes like this, and that, and that, just like the book thing. And, uh, I don't know what he's going to do for us next year, but I'm sure he'll think of something. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, I did, did have the temerity to write him a note saying, what would you think about using total U.S. stock market instead of S&P 500? And he never answered. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't have dreamed of asking him, what about international indexing? It's very clear. He knows what he's doing. The bad news, the fact that I've been right all these years, uh, means totally nothing about the future. Um, Maybe it will be it will be reversed, and I'll look like a damn fool. So take that take that into account. Um, but just think about what you what you're really trying to accomplish there. And you know, after all these years of lagging performance, it would not be amazing to see the performance reversed and have better performance in international in the U.S. And that could go on for a while. But in the long run, as a message I was trying to say in the data I showed you this morning, it's determined by the strength of the economies. The stock market has nothing to do with it. And the international stocks, non-U.S. stocks, look a little bit undervalued relative to the U.S., maybe even a little bit more than a little bit undervalued relative to the U.S. in terms of dividend yields and P.E. multiples for lower. Um, but maybe that's because they're riskier. Or is it because they're a good value? I, I don't think I, I don't see the need for it. And then I would finally say, supposing I'm wrong, is it possible an international would do better by, say, 2% a year than the U.S. in annual return? 
over the next 10 years? I think so, but it's not going to matter whether you have 2% a year difference, and that would be very large, and, but a long, long shot, I think. And you put that on 30% of your portfolio compared to zero, you certainly, certainly don't want to go 100% international. And you just get a very small increase in return unless you put everything there and bet that the international will do better than the U.S. And I think that's an unwise bet. So I have this clear, logical case that could be wrong, like anything, you know, like anything I do and say. Uh, but um, I, I do, I guess I, I guess I have to reverse the old expression, I do not eat my own cooking. I don't do international. I never have. Yeah, um, you know, I'll fall back on, you know, on, on Philip Tedlock, who, who writes about what like, lousy forecasters and human beings are, and how when we do have lousy forecasts, we never admit it. Uh, and I'll fall back on the cry of a lousy forecaster, which is, I haven't been proven right yet. <laughs> um, all right, well, the next question I suppose I have uh, has to do with ETFs. I'll start by asking for a show of hands. How many people in this audience own ETFs? <laughs> all right, so maybe it's not the job, but it's it's close too. And I ask a second. Can I ask a second? How many people trade them? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's certainly a field of both sides. Yeah, that's that's my point. And so. You know, I think that a lot of, if not most, small investors don't trade them. They just view them as, as, uh, as, as cheaper, perhaps easier, uh, or more fashionable substitutes for plain vanilla funds, TIFs. Um, and so my question is, is, don't you think that the turnover figures for the ETFs are skewed probably by uh, institutional investors who, you know, trade the things for their own reasons? The answer to that is absolutely. And I'm trying to look for, I think I skipped this chart earlier. Um, see if I can find it here for just one second. Um, well, let me kind of do it from. Oh, here we are. Uh, the ETFs are really two businesses one is an institutional trading business, and one is an individual business divided half into. People that are trading them with some activity, and people that are buying them and trading them very rarely, if at all, uh, because there are certain things you can do more easily in ETFs. I heard from a shareholder the other day, who just wanted to add money, but every once in a while he would withdraw it, and he was told he was going to be thrown out of the regular fund. Uh, and he was not a big trader. This is regular investing, but every once in a while he needed some money. And uh, whether well, this is a triumph of process over judgment, I leave to you. Uh, but. Um, he said, they said he could no longer do that, so he switched to an ETF. It's a perfectly valid reason for doing what he was doing. So I think we have to think a little bit about that. But if you look at, for example, the numbers, uh, states the, the big the big ETF that's trading, and dominant by far, is the S&P 500 Spider. And it turns over, it's going to have about $6.1 trillion of turnover this year on a $150 billion fund. And that's largely institutionally owned. 90, 88% of the shares are owned by institutions. And they're going long, they're going short. Sometimes they're hedging on this early speculation. Uh, but it is the most widely traded stock in the world every single day in terms of dollar volume. And uh, that's something totally new to the markets. And uh, that is, if I can tell you a little anecdote, which I describe in this piece I'm writing for the Financial Analyst Journal on this very, very subject. Uh, I was, a uh, man walked into my office in 1992, Nathan Most, a really nice man, he sent me some papers down a couple of days before, and he wanted to use Vanguard 500 index fund, the only index fund worth talking about in 1992, uh, as the basis for a new ID ad where you can trade it all day long in real time, trade the S&P 500 all day long in real time, think about that. Think about why anybody, what kind of a number would want to do that. Uh, but he was very nice, and I let him off easily. And I said, you know, we're the perfect partner for you. But I think index funds are designed to be bought. Well, I designed index funds to be bought and held forever. And this is the antithesis of that, so we're not going to do it. I, of course, consulted with, you know the answer, nobody. <laughs> I mean, I'm such a bad person. <laughs> I needed to consult with anybody. I just rejected it out of hand, like sitting in my office in the Valley Forge, uh, old office, and uh, old, old building. 
So he went on to State Street, and now I mean, it turns out I could have been the founder of not only of the first traditional index fund, Index 500 in 1974, but Index ETF 1992. A lot of people will tell you that shows how stupid I am. I look at it as a badge of pride. I look at it as an ability to stand for principle instead of market share. And I'm honestly very pleased with my decision. I have no regrets about it. And I don't mind shouting that from the rooftops. I'll tell you more about who I am and probably anything else. So we have that business. That's the dominant part of the institutional business. And you look out and all of, them, all of these State Street funds have 63% institutional ownership. All the BlackRock funds have 62% institutional ownership. And uh, State Streets turn over all their funds together at about 2,000% a year. BlackRock's at 6,000%, 600% a year. And Vanguard's with 43% institutional ownership, by far the smallest, only half of Spider, uh, turn over at 193% a year. Now, I never thought I would be proud. I mean, I think hold it, the turnover of 3% is kind of pushing the envelope. And here I am bragging about 193%. <laughs> Go figure. But there is a difference. There is a use for ETS, and an intelligent use. But trading them rapidly, back and forth, going from one sector to another, is not a good use. Being, met, being among the crazies, um, like uh, pro shares and direction and velocity and power, and very little institutional ownership, but they turn over the velocity shares. One of our ETF people had, you know, you can be long or short the market. You decide whether the market's going up or down today. I don't know how you figure that out when you do. Uh, just be sure you get it right, and you can get triple leverage on that. So if, if you're right and the market goes up 1%, you'll get a 3% return on your investment in a day. That's an annualized return of $2 trillion, two, two trillion percent or something. I don't know what it is. So uh, they're, they're just crazy, these leverage funds. There's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of what we call niche seeking, trying to find a little corn that nobody started an ETF in. And people find them every day. Cloud computing ETF. Emerging cancer. Well, that one's coming. Go on. I thought it was not a very good name anyway. And so there's a lot of junk out there. And these guys have velocity shares as a turnover of shares of 10,308%. And it's only 7% institutional ownership. Those are retail investors trading. Admittedly, they're a lot smaller than the others. Um, Power shares is the largest of the bunch. It's about $100 billion. And uh, they turn over 953%. I mean, they just, it really is a trying to be, and I've not been very good at this, to be candid with you. Um, ETFs are clearly the new way to speculate. Um, they, they, trading in ETFs is almost as great as trading in individual stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Going from 5% to about 95% of the trading compared to common stocks. So we know that's going on, but there is another business going on out there. So I haven't given enough time to or enough thought to of a useful ETF strategy. You know, and it comes back to my basic warning, which is a little bit cynical. Uh, maybe more than a little bit. ETFs are fine just so long as you don't trade them. <laughs> that is to say, putting in English, exchange traded funds are fine just so long as you don't trade them. And I, I think bringing trading throughout the day availability to investors is not an asset, it is a liability. And when you see that data one the market went down a thousand points in, I don't know, half an hour or something, a lot of ETFs traded at ridiculous prices, maybe discounts of 50 or 60 or 70 percent from their asset value. There were some sharpshooters who bought them up and people sold them. They said they had an open sale order and maybe the ETF was selling at 20 and they said, I want to sell it. Uh, if it gets to, let's say, 19, but if it goes from 20 to 3, they sell it at 3. And, and so, and that, that has actually happened. So we need to think about the structure of the ETF market, the structure of the stock market generally, about not naive and be putting in, you know, open stock orders without open sell orders, without a range of stocks, uh, things of that nature. But there is a business there, but if I had to guess, I'd say the ETF business is probably 65% institutional, 35% individual, 
and I'd say maybe a quarter of the individual total is people are using ETS in the right way rather than the wrong way. That's just a guess. Someday we'll find out. Uh, maybe even Vanguard knows that. No. Yeah, my, my opinion is that in a just world, uh, any executive, fund executive who brings out uh, a leveraged or an endorsed fund that shouldn't wear an army jumpsuit. All right, well, let's shift gears a little bit. The Center for Retirement Research in Boston, which the Mills group, uh, is, uh, brings out an uh, at risk index, retirement risk index every year. It was about 30%, 30% of people were over at risk 30 years ago, and now it's gone up 51%. Uh, and it increases every year by about a percent or two. The new model, by the way, is it's, it's very conservative. They assume that you take all of your retirement assets, annuitize it, and by the way, reverse mortgage your house, which means that the, the real percentage of people who are actually at risk is probably much higher. So, do you think that there's a retirement crisis, and what should we do about it? Well, first, the easy one yes, there is a retirement crisis. And yes, there is a retirement crisis in all three legs of the retirement stool. What is Social Security? And it would be so easy to fix if we had the political will to do it. With very small changes in uh, retirement age, in contributions, uh, in uh, maybe limiting uh, withdrawals to people who have reached a certain level of other income. There are all kinds of ways to do it. And basically, it would be not noticeable in the short run. But it's also politically charged. We can't get anybody to summon the willpower. So if we don't do something, well, everybody knows this number. I can't remember quite what it is myself, but everybody knows it. And that is by 2023, I think it is, unless we do something, Social Security will be paying out more than it's taking in. And it's easy to avoid that. But we need the political will, which, not to get into politics, we just don't have any political will to do anything in Washington, let alone intelligent things like fixing Social Security. And it'll get politicized like everything else, even like that fiduciary duty standard, and we'll get nowhere. But it can be fixed, so I'm optimistic that all only common sense will prevail. Uh, pension plans. Pension plans on the corporate side, declining. Pension plans on the state and local side, uh, continuing to be very strong. And they are all assuming 7.5% future returns. They're about 62% funded on average. So that's sharply underfunded. And when they're counting on a 7.5% return to balance the books over the next, say, 25 years, they're not going to get 7.5%. I mean, you got to be kidding me when the government bond 10-year note is 2.2%. And so there will, there will be, I think, a movement away from index funds because people are going to gradually accept that the future returns in the market, which is what index funds will deliver, will be, you know, maybe that 4% is a little bit low. Maybe it's a lot low, who knows? Maybe it's even high, we just don't know. But if you want to assume five, but you can't get in a balanced portfolio anything like 7.5%. So what the, what the uh, state and local funds are doing, it seems, is saying, okay, the index fund, their money is coming in index funds still, state and locally. But when they look at it, they say, this just, just will not do. And let's say, Bogle is right, the returns are going to be lower. So how do we get higher returns? Well, let's get a couple of good hedge fund managers, and let's get some uh, private equity managers. Well, first of all, two things. One, you have a tremendous selection premium. Which one do you pick? You know, they can be, there's no kind of common standard, and they use these terms like macro and this and that. I don't understand really what, what those various categories of hedge funds are. I do understand that very few of them are hedge funds, something we ought to think about. And that is to say, like my son actually runs an actual hedge fund, and he's 50% long, 50% short, 40 long stocks, 40 short stocks. If he's long in the auto field, he'll be short in the auto field. It can't be more conservative. He has a beta of, you know, just about zero or zero up to the market. And uh, turns in like five or six, seven, eight percent returns year after year. So that's a hedge fund, what they can do. But these others are basically managers with unusual strategies but only one common thread holding them together. It's a great money-making machine. It's a, hedge funds are a product of high fees, enormous fees for investment managers. They are, a, they are a compensation strategy and not an investment strategy, so-called hedge funds. It's no worth that. 
figuring they're not going to get it out of that. And even if one pension plan can do it, all pension plans cannot. This is another thing you want to do when you when you think about opportunities in the market. Can everybody do this? And it's quite clear that all hedge funds could not possibly do well enough to carry that uh, carry that seven and a half percent. So corporate is going to leave it there because they're going to have to put more money in if they can't go to five percent, let's say, uh, which is probably still a little too high. Uh, and uh, that means their earnings will go down. And the CEO on the job today doesn't want his earnings to go down because it's hoped this way. And when his successor gets stuck with the problem, <laughs> and I. They must think this way. I mean, they're businessmen, and uh, they want to look good. We all do, I guess. And uh, in state and local, it means either lower benefits, some of which are state constitution enabled. You can't, you can't seem to get around it. Or the other thing is to do is not reduce benefits, but raise taxes. And taxpayers have to approve tax increases. So the private pension system is going to be in shambles. I mean, it's going to be a serious economic problem. 401k system, the third leg, is has a, a very simple and fundamental flaw. These were thrift plans, and we've tried to massage them into being retirement plans. So all the things you would obviously do in a retirement plan, you would obviously not do in a thrift plan. Let people take their money out whenever they want to. Uh, supposing you could take money out, capital out of your social security account whenever you want. Does that make any sense at all? I mean, sometimes you really need it, but there has to be a very stern discipline about withdrawing, or you're going to be a burden on the state by the time you retire, um, for the nation in this case. So uh, there has to be much less flexibility in allowing people to move their money in and out, uh, to withdraw their money, to borrow against their assets. Um, and this is going to be tough, but that's what a retirement plan would do. The first plan doesn't really matter. And so we've got to fix that fundamental flaw. And uh, actually, I remember talking to Paul Volcker. We were doing an interview at a 60th anniversary they had for me at the Museum of Finance, the financial industry held for me. And uh, I was explaining, I said, uh, you know, if you'd give Paul and me, he, he was with me on the interview stand by a television announcer. I said, if you'd give Paul and me an hour, we could fix all three systems. And Paul looks up at me and says, couldn't we fix everything? <laughs> and then I don't think we could. <laughs> so that's a complete answer, I think. Well, thank you, Jack and Bill. Uh, we'll be hearing more from both of them in the next couple of days. We're running about 15 minutes late on the agenda. We're still going to take a 20 minute break. We'll catch up on a short in the Q&A, about 15 minutes with the experts, and we'll get back on schedule. Uh, everything else will follow. So, you can take a break now. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jack.